Good morning, Epic Church. Come on, let's give it up for Pastor Chris. Is he not the man? Hold on. What do we got going on here? Awesome. So my name is Wade Haskins, and I'm from Freedom Church, and I am so just thankful to be a part of this amazing church today. Um, and here's what I know about this church. There is a revival of all kinds of awesome stuff happening, but there is a revival of cool hair in this church. <laughs> Starting with its leader, then Cal walks out, and I'm like, oh, God, just take me home, Jesus. And then the guy that's just throwing back the melodic tones on the vocal team, I mean, it's just awesome. I just, Lord, just let it fall on me today. Man, the internal impact that Epic Church is having in this city, in this state, in this region, I just want to commend you for. God is using you, and the best is yet to come. Your best days are not behind you, Epic, they're in front of you. And I just believe today that we're just launching, as we close out 2019, yeah, I know it's hard to believe, but it's here. Um, I just believe that there's destiny that's happening for you and in front of you, and you're just going to just turn around in about six months, and you're just going to be blown away at what God has done, and thank you guys for having a willing heart to just lean into it, and I'll just say this real quickly, um, as my, my timer started, and I don't have, I have a lot to cover, so I got to get, um, as an overseer of Epic, um, I must affirm, and I just absolutely love with all of my heart, my wife Dawn, I believe she's going to be here at the next service. We, she had to be at our Freedom Church campus this morning. Um, I love Pastor Chris and Lori Lockerman. They're the real deal, man. They're the real McCoy. And um, I, I'm so grateful. And I must affirm that they are the most upstanding, honest, faithful leaders that I've ever been around in my life. I love their heart of humility. I love their teachable spirit. And I'm telling you, they lead with honor. You should never, ever question. I'm just telling you straight up. Um, they, they are pursuing their leaders. They're pursuing the people that oversee their heart. And I'm telling you, it is, it is an honor to have them as pastor over this great community. Do you love your pastors? Come on, somebody. Amen. All right. Um, it's, I can't say that about everybody, but it's, it, it, they make it real easy to say that about them. So I, I, it's an honor to do life with you. Um, so if you have your Bibles, let's turn, let's turn to Luke chapter 5. Uh, I've got several scriptures I want to read. Uh, I'm going to read from the New King James Version today, if that's okay. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Let me dive in. So it was, as the multitude pressed about Jesus to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake, and he saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. And he got into the one of the boats, in which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. When he stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets. Everyone say nets. It's plural, right? Let down your nets. I want you to remember that for a catch. And Simon answered and said to him, Master, we've told all night. We've caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the net. Everyone say the net. All right? Singular. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come help them, and they came and filled both boats, so they, they began to sink. Now, I want you to watch this just for a few seconds. This is the verse I really want you to kind of lean in. Verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And I want you to notice this, this moment with Simon Peter. And we're going to get back to this moment. When he saw this, he knelt down at that moment. All right? And the, the, the verse is going, For he and, and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also there with him. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you're going to, to be catchers of men. All right. So if you brought your Bibles... You can look at this with your own eyes, and if you don't have your Bibles, you can just have to trust me this morning, that if you go up a few verses from the story that we just read this morning, you're going to see Jesus, and as far as we know, this is his first introduction with Simon Peter. We know that Simon Peter is going to be known as the Apostle Simon Peter, the one who Jesus said, you're the rock, and upon the revelation that you have concerning me, I'm going to build the church. We're here this morning building the church because of this moment, right? And the gates of hell 
are not going to prevail against the church. And Simon Peter, the primary voice, the initial voice on the day of Pentecost, who stood up and preached and 3,000 people got saved. Wouldn't that be an amazing day? Come on, somebody, right? This is the guy who led the early church into what we're participating in this morning and experiencing every day of our life. This is his initial introduction with Jesus. And so Jesus comes to Galilee and he enters Simon Peter's house. And he's not Simon Peter the apostle yet. He's just Simon. And so Jesus enters into his house. When he enters into the house, Simon's mother-in-law is there and the bible says that she has a fever when he enters into his house his mother-in-law's there and he's she's got a fever and they know a little bit about jesus but his reputation has preceded him and so they ask jesus to pray and simon asks jesus hey will you pray for my mother-in-law and jesus the bible says that jesus lays hands on simon peter's mother-in-law and she is healed the fever leaves her News concerning this miracle began to go throughout all Galilee. So all the people that heard about this miracle began to gather the sick, gather the hurt, gather the disease. And they began to make a pilgrimage to Simon's house. They brought right to the front porch, to the front steps of Simon's house. There they are, the the distraught, the sick, those that were lame, those that had fever. And I don't know, some of you have taken trips to Israel, but earlier this year I was able to stand on the steps of Simon's house. It's quite amazing. They unfortunately built this massive building on top of it, but there I was, right? Now, I don't know if they brought them into Simon's house. We don't know the details of all this, but what we do know, it was at Simon's house, and from Simon's house, Jesus prayed for every single sick person that came, every diseased person that was brought, and he laid hands on them, and all were healed. It, all, it goes on to say, in fact, that those who showed up, even the demon possessed. Those demons were cast out of those people, and those people were set free by the power of God. Now, I want you to catch this. I want you to catch that all of these events happened right before Jesus shows up to get on Simon's boat. So if you read a few scriptures early on, the the one that we read this morning, all of these stories, all of these scenarios, all of these miracles happen. And and, and in verse 8, it reads that Simon Peter, when he saw this, and he's talking about the catch that they just brought in, he falls at Jesus' feet and says, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Now what I want you to notice is that Simon Peter watches Jesus heal his mother-in-law, and he's unchanged. He watches Jesus heal the sick from Galilee. He's unchanged. He he watches the demon possessed be delivered from his front porch, on his front steps, his front yard, and yet he's unchanged. But Jesus then enters the boat of Simon, and through the interaction of this great miracle, Simon falls on his knees at the feet of Jesus and says, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And this is what I want you to see through this topic this morning, is that is the miracle of involvement. Or maybe the miracle of participation. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to get involved. Right? As many miracles that Jesus did, and and as many miracles as Simon saw, he watched, he spectated. It wasn't until there was a participation with Jesus that Simon's life was changed. Which leads us to show us that how God truly changes us is by involving us. Are 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 you tracking with me? Am I preaching all right just for the short just for the short short part of the sermon, right? Right? A surrendered life isn't fully experienced spectating. God will do his deepest work in your life when you're not only allowing him to work in you, but you allow him to work through you. Can I get a good amen, somebody? Now, I know it's God's grace that saves us. I know it's his love. I know it's his mercy. And I'm not talking about getting to heaven this morning only. We're talking about coming to a place in your life where you're changed for the here and now. You're changed from the inside out. You're changed from the way that you look at God and the way that you look at yourself. And the way that this happens is not only by spectating, but it's by participating in what God is doing. There's some miracles you'll never see in your life until you participate with God. Amen. And here we have in this story, Simon Peter experiencing the miracle of involvement. We have in this story, Simon Peter experiencing the miracle of participation. 
Jesus is walking toward the lake, and as he's walking toward the lake, and my, there's my clock, okay, it went out for a minute. As he's walking toward the lake, he notices that something's just a little bit off. There's two fishing vessels, there's, they're unmanned, they're, there's no captain, there's no crew, there's no catch. They're, they're on the shore, and he begins to investigate why they're there, and as he's investigating while they're there, he looks over and he sees fishermen washing their nets. There's an empty boat. There's fishermen washing their nets. The picture's really simple. They, these men have fished all day and they've caught nothing. They've toiled and, they, and they've worked and they've caught nothing. Now, there's more, I'm not a fisherman, by the way, but there's nothing more miserable than to go fishing and not catch anything. Can I get, get a holler at your boy? Right? Now, if we're catching something, I'm all right with it. But if we're out there all day wasting time, and I'm telling you, it, there's nothing worse than just wasting time on a, on, a, on, the, on a shore or on a boat, right? They, and they fished all day, and they've caught nothing. And so they've given up. They've quit. They've made the decision. There's no catch for the day. We're done. We're out. Deuces. We're going home. Now, if you know anything about these individuals, in this story, we've got Simon Peter, and we've got James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now, if you know anything about these guys, you would know that they're, they're massive personalities. I mean, these guys are incredibly temperamental. I mean, in fact, they're called sons of thunder, right? They've got anger issues. Does anybody in the house have anger issues? You're lying, all right? <laughs> or you know somebody. Maybe you're sitting by somebody that's got a little bit of anger. I mean, you have, they have, they, these guys had a button. You push the button things would explode. I mean, these were explosive people. In, in fact, Simon Peter is known for his loud mouth. I mean, the guy cusses and denies Jesus three times. I mean, these guys are rough around the edges. I mean, these are men's men. They fished all day. They've caught nothing. They're frustrated. They're tired. They're fatigued. They're angry. They're mad. And Jesus walks up on the situation, and they're washing their nets. Translation, this is an emotionally charged moment. Can't believe this. You should have brought different bait. We should have got up early. You overslept, John. I mean, and they're going, they're blaming each other. And Jesus walks up on this moment, and he walks onto Simon Peter's boat and says, Hey, guys, let's go. The first point that I want to make this morning in this, in this talk today is that Jesus will not ask you if you feel like it. How many have been there? It's been a bad day. I'm tired. I don't feel like it, God. I don't, it's not, would you come back on another day, Jesus? Isn't it funny how we allow our feelings to tell us what to do? You know what I'm saying? We, we allow sometimes our feelings to have the final say. Well, I don't feel like it or I don't want to. We allow our emotions to tell us what to do. But you don't, hear me, church, you don't feel your way into participation. You faith your way into participation, right? If you try to feel your way into involvement with God, if you try to feel your way into participation, can I tell you, you'll never do anything because rarely will our flesh feel like doing something spiritual. This is all right, right? Pastors, this is all right, right? right. One of the lessons, one of the lessons uh, that you learn in being a Jesus follower is that I'm not flesh-led, I'm not feeling-led, I'm spirit-led. Whenever something spiritual comes up, you can't access how you can't assess how you feel. You got to dig a little bit deeper in your soul and you've got to allow God to lead you through your spirit. We walk by faith, not by we walk by faith, not by sight. You know what the opposite of faith is? It's sight. Right? The opposite the opposite of faith is spectating. The, uh, the opposite of faith is, you know what, I'll just kind of sit and just kind of let everybody else do it. Or I'll just take the bleachers. No, we have to get in the game. I believe today that God is calling his people to get in the game. Amen. How many people miss out on a miracle because they don't feel like it? Well, I just feel like kind of watching this weekend. I just kind of feel like watching at my workplace. I just kind of feel like watching at this new school that I'm diving into. I just feel like spectating. No. God, I've had a bad time. I've had a bad day. I've had a bad year. I've had a bad season. God, you should know that of all people. Come back on a better day. Come back on a better time when I feel like it. You know, the miracle of involvement, the miracle of participation teaches us that Jesus will never ask you if you feel like it because there will always be a legitimate reason to say no. 
That's why we're called believers, not feelers. We're called believers. God calls us to be the believing ones, not the feeling ones. Amen. Point number two. Expect a big ask. Expect always in this, in this game with God, in this process of being God followers, you need to expect Epic Church. I'm going to tell you right now, and we're experiencing the same thing at Freedom Church. You just need to get ready. Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready. Expect a big ask. If you want a big return, there's going to be a big risk. God, I'm telling you, we need to get comfortable, church, by jumping off the cliff. Because if we'll jump off the cliff, we know that there is a God that's real good at catching. Amen. Expect a big ask. Jesus is asking for Simon Peter's fishing vessel. He's asking for his livelihood. He's asking for his business. He's asking how he feeds his family. And Jesus is not saying, hey, Simon, I want you to come to a church service and listen to me preach, right? I don't want you to just get on the app this weekend and, it's, and, and holler at your boy on the app. You know what I'm saying? No, Jesus is inviting himself into Simon's personal business. Simon, you spent your whole life building this. You spent your whole life working on this. You've spent your whole life doing what you can do to build this fishing business. Now, I want to use it to, pro, to, to get the gospel out. Right? How many people miss out on, on a miracle because they want to tell Jesus, well, Jesus, you can have this part of my life. You can have this, but you can't have this area. Not a big deal, Jesus. You want to show up and use my house? All good. Come on, man. Right? You want to heal my mother-in-law? Can we talk about that first? You know what I'm saying? No, I mean, no, you know, I mean, like, go for it. Jesus, you want to use my front porch? It's all yours. But my boat? Hold up. My career? Hold up. Don't ask me to do that. Has Jesus ever asked you to do something you've already concluded? The answer is no. If, if not, you, 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 you haven't fully experienced the miracle of participation. Because I can tell you this morning, in all honesty, that most of the things that in my life that have turned up are because there are things I said, God, you can ask me to do a whole lot, but don't ask me to do that. If you ask me to do that, I'm out. If you ask me to do that, God, I want you to pick somebody else. And one of those things is actually standing in front of you this morning. God, if you ask me to speak, if you ask me to preach, find someone else. But you know exactly where Jesus eventually goes. And eventually what he asked of me is the very thing that I said, no, I'll never do that. I'm telling you, church, you need to just get an expectation for a big ask. Right? Number three, point number three, Jesus is really after you. Jesus was not after Simon's boat. I mean, Jesus was not after Simon's livelihood. He was after Simon. Jesus used the boat, right? But his focus wasn't on the boat. His focus was on Simon. Jesus would use the boat for one reason. Ultimately, yes, to preach the gospel and to bless people. But ultimately, we see he used the boat to get closer to his man. And Jesus knew what the boat meant to Simon. So he used what meant something great to Simon to gain access to the heart of Simon. Jesus isn't after what you do or what you have. I'm telling you, Jesus is after your heart. He's interested in your life. Think about this with me for a second. I'm not saying that Simon Peter didn't care for his mother-in-law. But we, what we read in the story, Jesus goes to Simon's house. He shows up at his house, and Simon's mother-in-law is there, and she's got a fever. It, it's not that Simon Peter didn't care about this, or, it, or, or maybe he didn't care about his house. It's not that he didn't care for the people that were being healed on his front lawn. It's that all of these things, as much as maybe they should have meant to him, those things did not mean as much to him as his boat. So I want you to notice the lesson that's in here. Jesus is not going to ask you for something that is not of great value to you. They call me P-Dub at Freedom Church. P-Dub, I've worked really hard for this. Pastor, I've got this plan. I've got these dreams. I mean, I've got these desires. I've got these hopes. Right there, that's what Jesus is after. Because he wants whatever we do for him to move us. 
it's at the intersection of sacrifice that most people stop and say, nope, I'm good. But God says, if it'll move you, it'll move me. Are you with me? If it'll move you, then it'll move me. And Simon, it was his fishing boat. So, Epic Church, what is our fishing boat? Come on, moms and dads, what is, what is your fishing boat? Students, what is your fishing boat? We've all got them. And a lot of times we've, we've given God access to other things, and it's not that those things are not important, but we've held back the things that move us. And it's not what we have. It's not what we do. At the end of the day, God is after us. He's not after our boat. He was after Simon. And Jesus knew the door to Simon's heart would be opened by the value of his gift. And this is how the Bible works over and over and over. It's crazy how much this happens. Mary, Mary, God tells her to take an alabaster box full of expensive perfume, one year's wages to be exact. And, and you go break this alabaster box over the feet of Jesus. If you would study this in culture, this is what women say their whole life to use on their wedding night. This alabaster box. Jesus is a grown man for crying out loud. He doesn't want to smell like women's perfume all day. <laughs> this perfume meant nothing to him. But the gift was of great value to the giver. And because it moved her, it moved Jesus. Right? Amen. The widow that brings her might, and Jesus says she's out giving them all. It wasn't the amount. The amount could have been zero. Literally, it could have been nothing. But it was the value of the gift that moved the giver. And because it moved the widow, it moved him. It's never been about time, a might, perfume, a boat, a financial gift. It's never about those things. It's always been about you. It's always been about your heart. It's always been about your life. Does it move you? And it's always the question that we should bring to the table in our relationship with Jesus. It's going to be a big ask. It's not about the gift. It's about you. God is looking at you. The boat in this story with Simon Peter, it wasn't enough. He said, hey, launch out to the deep and let down your nets. And you know what? This hit a sore, I believe this hit a sore spot with Peter because this was an area that Simon Peter had already failed. He'd already been there and done that. He, he's got the t-shirt, right? He, he was out that morning and he, he was a failure. This is an area where he already tried, but he already gave up. And Jesus is hilarious, right? He's like a doctor. He walks in and searches for that painful area of our life. And when he finds it, he just begins to push on it and push on it and press in on it. And so Jesus was telling Simon Peter, hey, listen, Simon, you know what? The boat's not enough. What I want you to do is I want to work on areas that you've given up on, but that, that I've not given up on yet. All right? And, and here's my final point. The bank could come, and we can, we're going to land the plane, and the church say amen. Right? Here's my final point, that God can use you in spite of you. God can use you in spite of you. Most people don't get involved with what God's doing because they look at their life and like Simon, man, I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful woman. And we begin to disqualify ourselves and we miss out on the miracle and the life change that God has for us. Because before we even, before we even say, you know what, I want to get involved with you, God, we've already discounted our life. I've done too much. God would never want me. God would never want to use my story. And that is a lie from hell this morning. The miracle happened in Simon not as he got everything perfect. The miracle happened in Simon's life not when he got it all together. Not when he became faithful to a church. Not when he, when he said all the right things and did all the right things. It happened after he was willing to involve himself. In spite of the fact that there were areas of his life that were fractures and failures he'd given up on. I want to tell someone today, God is not intimidated by our failure. Amen. God's not intimidated by the areas that were weak and where we failed before and before and before. Our job is to say, okay, maybe I failed here, but I'm going to jump in God's business anyway. Our job is to say, okay, maybe I failed in this spot before, but I am still going to allow my life to in be involved with God. I'm still going to allow my life to participate in what God is doing in spite of my failures. And you know what's the truth? We would, we would have decided to do exactly what Peter did. 
Now, if I was Jesus in the story, I wouldn't make a good Jesus. I'm not a good Jesus. But I'd be walking through like, I'd say, okay, I want that boat. That boat over there is the best boat. It's got the best motor. It looks awesome. It's got great presentation. It's excellent. Give me that great captain over there. He's already caught everything all day. His limit is max, right? Get, come on, come on, God. I need you, and I need your team. I would, I would assemble the best team, bro. We would walk out, and we would be, it would be awesome. But that's not how Jesus does. As a matter of fact, Jesus walked by all those perfect people that had a great catch, that had it all together. And he goes to the boat where they had given up, where they had quit, where they had caught nothing. And what, what teaches us that Jesus is nothing like us. When he goes looking for someone to participate with him, when he goes looking for someone to involve, he's not looking for the most successful. He's not looking for people that everyone and maybe in culture would say, oh, that guy's got it going on. That person would probably be the best person for that team. No, he's out there looking for people that have tried, that have failed, that they have hung up their nets, that said, you know what, I am done. Cuss, 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 I quit, right? I am, I am out for the count. I don't want to show up anymore. I don't feel like it. I can't do this anymore. They've concluded that they're done. And I, and I just believe today that someone in this room today is probably standing somewhere spiritually washing your nets. You're done. You feel like giving up. Someone may in their heart, you, you may not outwardly be saying this right now, but in your heart you're saying, God, I'm done. I don't want to be involved. I've tried. God, your kingdom, I get it, but it's just a bad season. I failed. Some, in fact, I failed last night. But just because you failed before, just because you failed up to this point, does not mean that God cannot get involved with you and help you find success in the area that you previously failed. I want you to notice this in closing, that it's in the same area that Peter failed. Fished all night, caught nothing. In the exact same area, Jesus found fish. Same body of water, same boat, same crew, same captain, same everything. Only difference, Jesus got involved. Amen. He's already fixed it. He's already fixed it where we have to involve him. And my, my, my heart just wants to scream out today that the miracle of participation is that God changes us by involving us. You get involved in God's business, he gets involved in your business. You get involved in God's work, he gets involved in your work. You get involved in God's house, he gets involved in your house. He changes everything from the inside out by involving us. And the story ends pretty spectacular. Let's all stand, everybody. You remember Jesus said, cast down the nets. Remember that? He said that in Scripture, cast down your nets. And Peter, what did he do? He cast down his net. He'd already, even though Peter got involved, even though there was a miracle working, he already put a limit on God. He already concluded that God's limited. Like there's some things that God can do, some things he can't do. Some of you might be here saying, you know what, I'm so thankful that God has healed their marriage, but I'm not sure if he's going to heal mine. Or I'm, I, I can rejoice for someone getting healed of their, of their disease, but I don't, I don't feel God's doing anything for mine. Come on, I, I wonder if we could just take the limits off today. And just let God be God. And the miracle that happens is he invites us to be involved with him. And you know the story. Peter cast down his net and, and almost sank the ship. And at this moment, at this moment, Peter had already seen the miracles at his house. Demons being cast out. All this stuff. But at this moment, during this miracle, Peter falls on his knees and he says, I'm a sinful man. Jesus, I can't believe you involved me. Jesus, I can't believe you invited me. I can't believe that you allowed me, to, allowed me to be a part of something this spectacular. In spite of who I am, in spite of what I've said, in spite of what I've done, in spite of my weakness, in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of my inconsistencies, in spite of the way that I think, in spite of the things that I do, God, I cannot believe that you still Use me. 
You know the story. Jesus looks at him and said, you know what? It's never about the boat. It wasn't about the catch. Simon, I just wanted to get to your heart. And oh, by the way, from now on, you're not going to catch fish anymore. We're going to be fishers of men. The miracle happens when we get involved with what he's doing. So I just want to pray over us this morning. Maybe you're here today and you're like, Pastor Wade, I want to be involved. I want to, I want to get involved in what God is doing. But, man, I, I just don't. My mind, my mind won't let me. There's, and I'm telling you, the shame, the shame, the things that I've done, the things that I've said, the things that I've thought are just getting in the way of allowing me to open up my heart. I just want to tell you right now that it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've failed before. It's in those moments that God wants to do an amazing work through you. So, God, right now, I pray. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just... Show your love in ways, God, that we've never seen before. God, bring back the awe this morning. Bring back the joy of our salvation. Bring back the moment, to that, the, the very first moment where we believed that you could do anything. God, I, as, a, as a little child, God, I pray, Lord, that our faith would be restored today in who you are. And God, I just invite every heart, I invite every soul, I invite every mind to be open to what you want to do to get involved with what you're doing, to involve you today by asking you into our heart. I wonder if there's anybody here today that would just pray this prayer with me. Lord, forgive me. I'm sorry. I come to you today fresh and new. Lord, forgive me for the things I've thought. Forgive me for the things I've said. Forgive me of the things that I've done. I invite you back into the place of my heart where you belong. Fill this void in my spirit. I give you my life. I give you my everything. Jesus, I believe that you came and you died on a cross. You paid a debt that I could never pay. You got involved with me. And this morning, I get involved with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we just celebrate what, for what God has just done?